Bis dann. Okay, very good. We've got a good starting point for anything we want to look at. I think some of the key points, one of the key points too, was this idea of not just being bound and limited by the programming. You have to be in touch with what the programming is, but since this is a world of projection, then oftentimes the default setting of the mind in terms of relationships is that it just projects the meaning onto the world. Everything that it believes is good and right and the way things should be gets projected onto the world, and more specifically, if there's a group of us that seem to be working together on the same goal for healing and spiritual awakening and self-realization, then it gets projected onto the community. So people can seem to have hesitations about relationship, hesitations about affection, hesitations about how they are to go about their their day, what, what are the do's and the don'ts, what are the rules, that's very typical, but it's part of just the whole conditioning of, of being human, of believing that you're human, because that goes on in childhood, where you, you look at it, oftentimes in these kind of videos, it will be as if we have to, they'll say, like Teal's saying, we have to look at the way we raise children, but the way the children seem to be raised are a projection of the mind. So the mind believes certain things and then the parents and the children just act out the beliefs. Nobody's ever victimized by what happened in childhood. That's like transcending that old psychoanalytic model of, oh, what happened during this time in your childhood, or what happened at this time, or this year, traumatic experiences, as if they're causative, but events and circumstances and situations are never causative. They're all projections. So as we start to understand that everything in the world, everything in the community, everything that goes on in the sanctuary, everything that goes on in, in AC's kitchen, is a projection. And so that gets acted out. If things, plates and crumbs get left behind, and AC comes and says, I'm not your mother, um, she's withdrawing. <laughs> away from the belief that, that she's playing some kind of a role mm. over other people. And I just say facetiously, AC's Kitchen, because she doesn't have ownership over it. She's volunteered. She's doing it out of love and... Steward. Steward. She's like a steward of the kitchen. Mm. And that's what we're practicing with, with roles. Uh, roles in the community and and even with relationship roles, you know, it's, it's seen as their opportunities, their gifts for getting in touch with what's going on in the mind. Teal mentioned that, she said that like from a spiritual perspective, that's the highest kind of spiritual ideal, is that relationships are mirrors. And we talk about that all the time. All the time in holy relationship videos, and even in that parenting and and children video, they're just mirroring, mirroring, mirroring. I, I was at a farm in, on a sunny weekend in rural Sweden and we talked about mirroring. And that seemed to be helpful for the mind that was identified as being a parent and all the guilt about doing it right or not doing it good enough to start to say, oh, what are, what are they mirroring back to me? Oh, that's a nice way to look at this. It's very helpful instead of sticking into these roles and feeling, I'm not fulfilling the roles, I'm not doing it good enough. Which is a lot of guilt. So, I think, yeah, watching this and what we talk about, it's all about kind of releasing the past and releasing the roles and, and coming into trust, coming into guidance, trust, coming into spontaneity, and letting that be at the forefront. And maybe just beginning to expose programming and beliefs about, well, I believe relationships are this, or I believe this relationship is better than that relationship, or I notice, hmm, there's a tendency in my mind to judge certain things about relationships. 
good or bad, right or wrong, to start to project programming and beliefs out onto other people and to yourself as a body and to the community. Um, that's happened with a lot of communities too where, you know, of course here in Utah, um, polygamy, you know, there's, there's certain beliefs that get projected at, or we could say acted out, but they're still projected. They're still just beliefs in the mind. And we're here to expose beliefs. We're not here to judge people or judge things as if they're external to our mind. We're here to see, oh, I'm just seeing what I'm believing. So we have a strong focus. We have a strong focus in healing. I'd say, in one sense, it's, it's almost like a huge, huge gift to have a teaching like A Course in Miracles from an actual awakened mind, mm. not just, you know, a, an aside or something that somebody projects. But, with, but the actual experience of, oh, I've, I've been through the keyhole and um, it's wonderful. The light is wonderful. It's good to open up. We don't even have to come to the idea of positive reasons or negative reasons for things. Really, we're looking at what's the purpose. The purpose is, is everything. I did like, when she was talking on the final video, where she said instead of us trying to force ourselves to find some kind of an agreement that they, she basically was advocating instead of trying to look for all the positive reasons for something or, or forcing an agreement, we're, we started to look at our woundedness. And really that's, that's the path of The Course in Miracles, that's the path we're taking too. Look at the darkness. Mm -hmm. The more you look at the belief, the more you look at the error, the less you see of it. Meaning the more you look at, the more you expose the darkness and the falsity, the less you'll see it in perception. Because by looking at it with the Holy Spirit and seeing the nothingness of the darkness, then you don't see it reflected anymore. You literally, the entire world shifts and changes. And she hinted at that, you know, where she was talking about if you're, you know, polyamorous and you uh, have a resistance to marriage, you have to take a look at what you're judging against. If you, if you go, oh marriage, a lot of people have very negative attitudes about marriage. They'll use stereotypes like the ball and chain. Mm -hmm. You know, when that is the reference to marriage, then it's clearly seen as a negative thing. And there must be something, maybe a fear of commitment, Maybe a fear of intimacy, maybe a fear of, of, of a deep connectedness that's going on in the mind, and then the ball and chain. Also she mentioned about the idea of, of autonomy always being of the ego, and this idea that um, by, by just switching partners, switching, 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 it, it can be very much an escapism. Mm -hmm. It's even interesting in the literature surrounding A Course in Miracles, where at one point during the dictation, Jesus would take time out to talk to Helen and Bill, and basically he told them both that they picked their life partners to avoid intimacy. That's pretty amazing. They picked their life partners to avoid intimacy. So Helen picked Louis. Um, to avoid intimacy. And all kinds of things came out in that dictation of Jesus working with, with Helen and Bill. There was even a point where, where Helen decided to change Louis' name because she felt he, he was such a sinner, he'd done so many things wrong that he would never make it to heaven. So she thought by changing his name yeah. from Louis to Jonathan, he'd have a better chance of getting in. That's a very funny little antidote from working with the course material, but to change someone's name, I think they'll have a better chance of making it back home. That's a name substitution, but it often happens that there's partner substitutions. Or even picking a partner out of the false sense of lack and guilt and really a fear of love, and then having a partner come in that just it's part of reenacting that, because I know we've done that. All of us can probably look back at relationships we've had, and we went, 
wow, it was really intense and dark. And it was like, we can only say, wow, I must have been afraid of the intimacy, afraid of the love, to have projected out and had that enacted out in these characters clashing and doing wild, crazy things to each other and so on and so forth. We can start to see, I, I must not have valued my own being, my own love, my own worth, to have projected out something like that. So, in practical terms, again, it all comes back to the mind washing, it all comes back to what's the purpose and everything, but certainly in our community we have never tried to steer people towards something or away from something. We've had uh, marriages in the community, there's been relationships in the community, they've been called many different names. Uh, Nikita always reminds me of the word assignments, like there's been assignments. That was a term that was used early on, like, oh, relationship assignments. Mm -hmm. Like it's almost like a, a reflection of a classroom of the mind for a lot of mirroring going on for a period of time. Jesus has three levels of relationship that he mentions in the manual for teachers, casual encounters, like two people meeting in an elevator or on the street or something. He talks about then there's the teaching learning opportunities that exist for a period of time um, in which the two then appear to separate. And then there's lifelong relationships. And a lot of people in our community have felt that there's something to this lifelong thing that perhaps there, this even could be part of a configuration that could be a lifelong thing. I know Frances one time said she received a sense that she would be a lifelong companion with me, implying that, that regardless of how the form of things would look, that, that this would be something that people were brought together. And those things do happen. We see there's examples of it, but even if you look with the Course in Miracles, um, even though Helen and Bill had their collaborative time, and then um, they did travel a little bit, um, that actually the, the four that kind of came together as part of the, the bringing, the stewarding of the Course, Helen and Bill and Ken Rocknick and Judy, you know, they basically, during their lifetimes, remained friends. And certainly now, even with William Whitson coming in and marrying Judy, who's still alive, and uh, Bob Scutch, her first husband, both William and Bob have been very important in the publishing of the course into 23 different languages, and uh, William and, and Judy are still married, 80 four years old, and 87, and there's Bob right there alongside the three of them, and he's 90. So everybody who tells you two's company, three's a crowd, oh, these three have been going at this, translating, publishing the book, working together, collaborating, and they're ranging from 84 to 90, so that, that's an example, you could say, of a lifelong relationship. They also were brought together for a purpose. They probably, we could say, maybe wouldn't have had much in common at all without the Course. The Course is what they made a lifelong commitment to, and it's been used for a very high purpose. And so, even though Teal ends up by saying, you know, you may change what you want, you may change what you desire, you don't know what that will be like in the future, there are some configurations that do seem to be uh, what we would call lifelong, and because they're serving a purpose. Not that they mean anything specifically or specially, because bodies just don't mean anything in the end. You know, they don't, we can't even talk about lifetimes in the end, when we're going into an experience of love and light that transcends the body entirely. So, what I think is important is, we just continue our open discussions, and we start to realize, again, that everything that we perceive is what we believe, and we take responsibility for our state of mind, and we don't try to just let the, these beliefs and thoughts about relationships and, and so forth de be a determiner of holding back from 
expanding. You know, she said that the marriage vow should be uh, until expansions are in part, which is kind of funny because, you know, it still has the part mm -hmm. in the Just end, where in, until expansion do we realize our oneness may be our wedding vow or our pur purpose to keep expanding in consciousness, to keep opening our perception wider and wider, to keep seeing the big picture until even the big picture disappears, mm -hmm. and only love and light remain. That's maybe a way of verbalizing, you know, what we're about. But also not having these concerns and guilt around the form of a relationship, because I would say it's the guidance that's always the most important thing. It's the guidance from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is most important, and not the form even though this is a world based on the importance of form. There would be no tabloids, there would be no writing in newspapers, who's with who. You know, you see it all the time, who's, who got married, so and so, they got off with a private wedding and now they're announcing it to the press. They didn't want the press there, but, you know, it's like part of the daily columns of who's with who, who's with who. Over the years, you know, even when I would travel and want to just come and talk to people about forgiveness and have really good, deep heart-to-heart -heart conversations with them, um, oftentimes people I would meet with, they were more curious of who's with who. Uh, who I was with, or who such and such was with, tell me about so and so, what are they doing? Are they, are they still together? Did they break up? You know, it's just this, this incessant curiosity about form and specifics, which in the end we have to realize if we leave that over to guidance, then we're just flowing with the Spirit and letting the Spirit orchestrate the form and, and use the form for our greater good. Teal also mentioned a lot of reasons, she used like a historical evolutionary perspective about, you know, 11,000 years ago, you know, we, we shifted from being more wandering nomads and hunting and gatherings into farming. And then, as if, that's once we started farming, then we started to work the land, and then we got into property, and uh, no, actually if you go back, the ego is what property is all about. The ego is about ownership, and that's been there all along. It was there even during those hunting and gathering, going around and stabbing an animal and roasting it. <laughs> and eating it, you know, uh, that there was some ownership and some possession and some kill or be killed and survival and lack and everything going on there. So this ego belief system has been underneath everything that seems to, it's all about history. Jesus even tells us history wouldn't even exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. Well, that's good to know. You don't hear that every day. Our mothers and dads didn't tell us at the dinner table, you drink your Kool-Aid and finish your peas, and history wouldn't exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake. You know, we, we were not aware of the ego so fully. We were not aware of this wrong-mindedness, of this false way of looking at the world that's, that's very strange. As we become more aware, uh, those things may still enter your mind. You know, a lot of times people who are part of communities, if they see a value in the community and they see a helpfulness in the community, they still may divide the community off from the world. So then it becomes like they have to, have to stay in the community. Like it's a danger to go out. Almost like a movie, The Island, like where everything's contaminated, they're told. Everything's contaminated, so stay stay safe. Safe. Yeah, it's safe inside here because out there is contamination, and that's you know we've seen communities that if you leave the community you're a dead one. Right. And that kind of almost shaming, mm -hmm. like we are the elite and the dead ones. You know that's crazy ego use of of community symbols, which we really try to expose and. The ultimate reason of exposing is having an experience like Suzanne had, where she went to visit her biological family and 
Was it your little niece was Emmanuel. Emmanuel mm -hmm. took off her clothes, was running around naked, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. You know, in the context of those kind of things, you know, that's that when you feel the sameness with whoever you're with. And whatever they're doing, and if the little girl's running around naked, it's not a sense of judgment. It's like just smiles on the faces, not frowns. Uh, our cat Sweetie runs around naked every day. Nobody's dressed him up. But you you have to see that ultimately it's about being so much in purpose, and the purpose of community is to bring the darkness to the light. It's not about trying to fix the form, control the form. She did bring up that even in polyamory um, communities or, or situations with polyamory, she said there's, there's, it's going to force the ego out of this position of control, because the ego wants to control the environment. And when you have communities or you have people sharing love, and maybe not with sexual polyamory, but with what she called emotional or even verges of romantic gift giving or laying together or having a massage or doing all kinds of expressive things, still the ego is underneath if there's a sense of wanting to control situations. And control results in expectations. And expectations that seem to be violated is like what she would call violating boundaries. Maybe they're not even known boundaries. You're going along and all of a sudden someone says or does something and it's like, you feel a contraction. Like, that's it, you've, you've straw, walked over the line. That's the last straw, I'm not going to go for that. But you weren't even aware that there was a boundary there until some interpretation of an action or a behavior kind of brought it up into your awareness. What we're saying is, we're wanting those interpretations to be raised up into awareness. So in that sense, we're wel welcoming the raising of darkness, so that nothing is kept hidden, so that there can be a consistent experience of, of happiness. Mm -hmm. That's our framework for everything. But I don't want people having the sense of, of a prejudgment about, about the community. As if the community supports one form mm -hmm. over another. Because how do you evolve, how do you give it over fluidly to the Holy Spirit if you've already set the rules? Of course communities have rules because there's fear underneath. And Jesus says in the Course, the ego believes that without judgment all would be chaos. Without rules all would be chaos. And Jesus says, without judgment all would be love. That's two different perspectives. One required is calling for trust, that if we open all the way to love and we expose all the darkness, then all will be love. And the ego is saying, oh, you've got to have rules, and you will forever have rules. You'll die with rules. And there's rules even in hell. <laughs> you know, and you know, it's all about judgment. Because that's what perpetuates the guilt and perpetuates the ego. We don't take dr dramatic stands even on what are called physical symptoms, you know, where we don't have rules about magic which, or operations or anything. It's always a focus on mind training and, and healing this, ex exposing this guilt. Like for example, um, years ago when um, Lisa and I were in Loveland, Ohio, we went to visit our friend Doug Castle, and he was very concerned about our community and the future. Mm. He, that's his, he's a church consultant. And he said, what are you going to do when your community grows old and gets sick? How are you going to provide for the bodies? You know, that, that's, that's a common thing in, for most human beings, health care, future health care, thinking of nursing homes and so forth, and I think we said something like, well, we really, it's not really our focus. We're so focused on present healing that we don't spend a lot of time talking about what's going to happen 10 or 15 or 20 years down the road, but we did have, you know, recently with our dear friend Lila, who's very much a part of our community, going through this, you know, the liver and 
and the growth and the bio and all the different things and, and we approach that from a focus on healing of the mind. Uh, it was very much that, that, uh, that Kirsten was a part of that, Sarah was a very much a big part of that, Nikita was a big part of that. It was a focus on opening healing and then and more recently Suzanne had a lot of contact and then of course Lila came right here and that's been it's very much us sticking with our core values that it's healing in the mind that's that's what's important. That's what awakening is all about, it's healing in the mind. So we still dealt with the specifics of a plane flight of people to go and stay with her and help her move around, do her things, but all within the context of mirroring, all within the context of mind training. And so we don't really have all these programmed things about this is the way it has to be, even about relationships. And I guess recently with, with Eric and we've, we've actually, Kristen, they've just begun exploring their feelings and opening into this and that's just been a, in the recent days where that's started to open up. But it's also beautiful that it's being talked about openly in expression sessions. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a private matter. In one sense that's like huge advance, even you can see Teal uh, talking there and struggling with her marriage and saying, well, it's, it can be messy and they can butt heads and all these different things, but it, that was even around privacy. Whereas we've got the mechanics going already. And I mentioned that just before this on a call with uh, Kirsten and uh, Francis. They smiled, they were laughing, oh that's wonderful, wonderful. They just loved to hear the idea of what seemed to be a budding new relationship in the community being talked about so openly and freely uh, right here in the expression sessions in the sanctuary. So that's for us, I think, our key values starting to transfer, whereas we don't compartmentalize things and say, well, this is just this and this should be taken away and solved and that should be taken away and solved. It's more reflecting that bring everything, bring all your problems to the holy instant to open communication, to trust, and watch them vanish. So, I'm just interested in, yeah, everybody, we watched it, did it bring up anything? Were there questions that arose? Were there emotions that arose from it? Were there any fears that arose? Like, oh, oh, like there's, there's something big there? Uh, you know, this morning after Suzanne had just left to go to the monastery, then I met with, with uh, Lisa and Michael. They have their own mm -hmm. chemistry that got ignited today, and then the giddiness just the giddy. spilled over Bring into the, the, uh, <laughs> the Sunday service. Uh, you know, I, I was thinking how beautiful it is, because I feel like even like with this, whatever is, is happening here, it's like shared. Like I, when I was just looking at you, I feel like it's not this separate thing, like we're all in it together and how, you know, I think that the fear is, because I was even thinking that fear when you start a relationship, almost like you got to figure it out or, you know, it's all new and it's scary or whatever. And it's like really precious because like we're, you know, it's like this real beautiful thing that we're sharing in, just in the mind. New. Something new. And also just the healing that that brings. I heard there was a lot of stuff at the, there were a lot of things that were brought up this morning in the expression session. I don't know if it was brought to that or, or whatever. Just this really gift, that's the expansion to bring up those girls. So yeah, I feel it's like really purposeful. Yeah, it's great that, that the idea of, you don't know, see community as like a set concrete boundary, so even the stuff about being in the community or out of the community, it starts to just dissolve away in purpose. What is the purpose mm -hmm. for my entire perception? What is the purpose for the world? What is the purpose for the dream? It's huge. And it takes the pressure off of trying to put the commitment and put the the focus on the form and taking it back to the mind.
that's an amazing thing when you can start to lift everything up to the mind. Like, oh, what is this for? Is this, mm. does this feel supportive of my joy, my happiness, my expansion? Mm. Will it support me? Or will it hinder me? Is it based on an opening and a giddiness and a joy in the heart? Or is there a contraction? Like, oh, I need to do this. I should. I ought to. I have to. Is there a people-pleasing component to it? You know, we want to expose that uh, so that we don't ever have to hold on to those thoughts of beliefs to start to see that they don't serve. That's beautiful that it can be that way. Mm. And I think, um, yeah, the other idea is too that she was making the point about how monogamy or being single or polyamory, you know, of not thinking that there's a specific spiritual advantage in one over the other. I think that traditionally, you know, that a lot of spirituality, when we look at, at monks and nuns and so on and so forth, there was a specific focus mm -hmm. on a particular form. And, and certainly when people make contrasting, you know, uh, polyamor, uh, polyamory and, and monogamy, they, it will be again one of those things where people will try to come out and say one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. She was just making the point that it's it's really the purpose that's underneath. It's what is it for? It's not the form. That it goes nowhere mm -hmm. when you try to take one form and juxtapose it over another. That's morality. Mm -hmm. And she did point out, like Jesus says in the Course, that there is no universal uh, morality. There's no universal agreement. If you study all the cultures and all the different moral points of view, you'll find there's great contrast and there's no universal agreement. So I think it's it's good to stay open. I was saying that next year, 2016, could be a year of surprises, but that you should be welcoming mm. of that. It's almost, oh, look at that, it's a surprise. Like, that's a surprise. You know, a surprise can be an opportunity for healing. It doesn't mean, have to be an opportunity for judgment or distancing. It can be, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. And it comes down to expectations. We deal with people, we've done so many gatherings in so many countries, we've had hosts, we've had all these collaborations with people, even now with uh, the solar people in Mexico and up here, with solar up here and down there, with the, the electric company there. We have Moon Lake here and solar and down there they've got Matt and they've got the utility group. We, it comes down to releasing expectations and trusting the greater evolution and, and expansion that's happening instead of trying to zero in on a specific thing mm -hmm. like that would project it out as, as if there's an external problem. Oh, this one's got a problem, or that one's got a problem, or they cheated us, or mm -hmm. da, da 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 Those are just conclusions when we want to have much more faith and come back and say, no, there's it's all working together for the good. It's all lifting us higher and higher into the state of unification and oneness, non-judgment. It's a different perspective. We're not complaining about anything. I mean, I thought it was kind of novel to hear about what happened with all the cross wires. It's like, hmm, well, what do you know about that? The wires were crossed. You know, because there was a lot of questioning like, why are we being charged so much? And We'll get solar and we'll do this and this and this, even higher, <laughs> with solar. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, the wires were crossed. So then, mm -hmm. those are Hi, Jeff. Hi. 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 So, yeah, I'm interested in anything that, uh, anything that came up or any kind of things. Did you have a chance to see the video at all? Or? No. No? Oh, we just finished that one to my group. Okay. Well, then you can hear what everyone's got to share. We just had a nice... You know, what's it about? Polyamory? Polyamory? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You watch Polyamory? Yeah. Mary? Oh, yeah. Polyamory. <laughs> Did you say Polyamory? Poly no, Polyamory. Yeah. <coughs> no, not Polyamory. Polyamory. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, we were looking at yeah, those were what our videos were about polyamory, marriage, and then practical issues and applications mm. of dealing with those. Mm. In fact, when I was showed the videos to Michael the other day, he was saying, "Well, Teal brought up, she brought up uh, emotional polyamory, romantic polyamory, and sexual polyamory." And he said, "What is this romantic?" polyamory. So, we talked a little bit about what romantic polyamory would be, because um, she didn't go into a lot of detail, but just in terms of maybe examples and things. She did say that she felt that every, that the human race was evolving more towards polyamory, uh, conscious polyamory, she called it. It's like a value, where it's because it's an inclusive love, it's not an exclusive love. And she was saying that, you know, you can't rush that evolution, you can't try to leapfrog and jump over anything, but certainly that's the point of all of our, our discussions, because we realize that our, our beliefs determine our de seeming decisions in this world, so we're all about clearing the beliefs, so that our one remaining belief can be forgiveness, and all of our decisions can flow from atonement. From the atonement principle. So, but I always like in terms of practicality what what you saw, what you felt. There were hesitations, or I think for me, um, like yesterday, was such a profound experience because I could never understand what the course was talking about about the sameness and that you would love everybody the same. I just, I could never grasp what would be inspiring about that, or what would be sparkly about that. And so yesterday when I had that experience, right to when I went to bed, and it was like, I saw that this polyamory and all of this stuff is just, it's just like taking the mind higher and higher into, into that experience. It's not really about the form at all, and that's why I like it so highly individualized, because it's all just a washing around the personal perspective of things to take us into into that where everything is the same but not where there's any sacrifice in that and I think it was just so obvious in my experience yesterday because I'm so used to just being here you know and uh, to seemingly step outside but I really wasn't stepping outside the mind remained the same and you know, and then I, I asked Nikita last night, do you want to come and rest with me? And we, I just held her and just, just felt so, so restful and so beautiful. And so I, I guess I'm, I see how everything is just with this shared intention of this deep purpose. It's like, it's all being used for that. So it's great that it's not a cookie cutter. You know, one way for you is, you know, the way it needs to be for everybody. It's like, it's highly individualized, and and it's like the spirit knows exactly what we need. If that's our, if that is our focus in our mind, is that deep prayer of divine union, <coughs> then everything will take us into that. If that's out front, you know. Mm. And I just, I don't know. I, I guess for the first time, I had something seemingly to compare it with, and it was the same, and it, and it, and it felt very profound. Like, wow, there really is no sacrifice in loving everybody the same. And however that plays out in the moment is, it, is really pretty irrelevant at that point, right? It's like, so it's not even a thought about what's going to happen or how's this going to play out, because you're just kind of grounded in that. So. Mm -hmm. I just want to nurture that. It's like, wow, I just yeah. had no idea. I could never understand the whole sameness thing. What and the formlessness, you know, letting yeah. go of the, the idea of form, and then having those deep experiences where, whoa, nothing compares to no form, no matter how good it is, compares to that experience of divine love. You know, that's all. Yeah, it's like the the world's backwards and upside down with the ego. So. From that backwards and upside down perspective, it it's, seems like two people coming together or two people partnering up.
and if it's seen just as an event in and of itself, which is often what a marriage or the beginning of a new relationship is seen as, it has a very positive connotation. That's why people generally go to to throw rice and wear white and whatever and cupcakes and to celebrate a marriage. They don't go and bring handkerchiefs and cry unless you know you were the one left out of the bride and groom and and your love of your life is getting married to somebody else. Then you may come and and cry. But mostly they're generally celebrations. But that's in the backwards and upside down world. And then when we start to see every nothing is what it seems, which is our we watch an opening little clip. Nothing you see is as it seems, reminding us that everything's distorted. Then you start to realize, well, the only purpose of seeming partnerships or collaborations or projects or anything is the undoing of guilt or I will say the undoing of the belief in linear time. That that could literally be like a partnership vow or a marriage vow. Like, I, I joined together with you for the undoing of linear time in my mind. Which seems absurd to be if you ever saw that kind of a vow. There we go, well, we got two wackos there. We're going to talk about, I love you and I'll commit to till death to be part. And, I love you forever. It's like, love it. I'm here to like undo never heard that before. my belief in linear time. Which brings you right into true love. Right, well, you definitely are joining in forgiveness if yeah. you're joining in the end. Into that opening. Yeah, into seeing it's all simultaneous. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, we're kind of on the cutting edge here, because, you know, what she's calling intentional community, you know, we're going beyond, you know, sharing resources and you know, like she was saying, you know, if you have more people contributing, then it's more supportive, there's more love to go around, yeah, 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 that's all. Now, we're starting to get into the undoing of linear time, which, which we consciously talk about. But you can only imagine with, with Camas, or the monastery, or, you know, different places, we have Mexico, or this and that, imagine as you go more into that, that the very concept of partnership mm -hmm. will undergo tremendous transformation. Mm -hmm. Because if you start to let go of the belief in linear time, the idea of, she was even saying the idea of, of coupling, mm -hmm. when you get to higher and higher states of consciousness, mm -hmm. starts to lose meaning. Not that it was ever good or bad. It's like Her, the movie Her. Yeah, right. like the movie Her. That was a great demonstration. Mm -hmm of her going more communication, more communication, then with Alan Watts they bring in, mm -hmm. her communicating with Alan Watts, and then multiple people, that that her was, that's why we probably all appreciated her, the movie, because we went, huh, that's where this is all mm -hmm. seeming to head. And, and therefore that's not surprising, mm -hmm. or it shouldn't be too shocking, because there's a part of the mind that's going, hmm. Yes. That's, mm -hmm. So then, it would move towards momentary inspiration. And already, you know, even in recent years, we've just come together and we've focused on, on projects. We even had a, that period of time where we're like, okay, we're closing the circle. Well, just saying closing the circle brought up a lot of stuff. Some people were like, I'm in the circle. And I don't want to be. I want to be outside the circle. And then the ones, and some of them are like, they close the circle. Well, you know, I'm on the outside. That means does that mean I can never get in? And you know, it brought up a lot of stuff. And so, and then we've gone along, and we, we take our steps, and we we said, okay, we're going to get down and really focus on our purpose with our projects and our websites, SEO, and our publications, and this and this and this. Well, that brought up a lot of stuff. In bubbling in the community, all kinds of emotions coming out, people leaving the community, mm -hmm. the circles closing the circle, the shrinking of the circle. Mm. Uh, if this is what the circle is about, <laughs> I <laughs> want nothing. <laughs> all this baloney of circle of support, it's, a, it's like a noose, it's a circle around my neck, it's closing, can't breathe, I've got to get out and do something, you know, get away. But see, that's all part of it too, you know, it's all just... Whatever happening is not causative, it's just looking at, at your reactions. And for some that said, that's not my cup of tea, 
then like Teal would say, oh, very good then. And if this is my cup of tea, you may change your mind, as she said many times a day. It is my cup of tea. No, it's not. Yes, it is. No, it's not. It seems very schizophrenic. Uh, not knowing, am I in? Am I out? Is this my life calling? Maybe not. You know, it just goes round and round and round. But I think, you know, the most important thing is, is that the, there is healing happening. You can mm. feel it. You can see the heart opening up. You can feel the mind opening up through it all. And then, being in that place of acceptance where whatever seems to be happening, you can feel like, oh, I, I want to come to total acceptance, total contentment, that the world doesn't have a causative factor in that contentment. It's just a reflection of my mind, of my purpose in my mind. So that's beautiful, and that's the sense of saying this too, where it's not boring at all. I like what you said about commitment. Like, until there's truly a commitment made, no matter what it is, then the then the acceleration can't really occur because you're too busy. Like with that plan B in your mind to settle if it could, might be, it's it's a distraction. Like just to get completely committed. Yeah. Mm. And we've been talking about commitment here too. Yeah, commitment, and then it's I think a component. It's almost like that's. That's an ingredient that has to be there in order to, to go through the eye of the needle. Yeah, I think too, even the idea of like this casual encounters versus, you know, sustained relationships that seem to end versus lifelong relationships. Even those, before Jesus goes into those three distinctions, he basically, he's basically saying it's all the same. He starts off his whole teaching, it's all the same, but it's almost like, here I'll give you a something that you can relate to. And he gives the three, but he, he prefaces it by saying, you know, they're all, it's all the same. Because it's all really all one mind. So, I think for, for all of us, it's like, it's like coming to trust that, it's like where there's a real strong sense of a guidance, and still there can be open discussion about things, but we're, we're, everyone is learning to be more in alignment the higher power with guidance, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Everyone's coming into that alignment. That's something to be celebrated. And then to practice daily, that's what expression sessions are, that's what our use of lunches are, that's what our collaborative projects are all for that. Just to not see a problem. Mm -hmm. When the Holy Spirit is the guide, there is no problem. When the ego is the guide, then there will seem to be problems. Not that they're real, but they're in there in awareness. Yeah. I think I just really enjoyed actually just um, everything she was talking about I could relate to, like just in my life, like with relationships, you know, I've been married before, like a, a legal marriage, and I don't know, I just feel like I've been mostly in, I guess I, the only thing I can call it is like unconscious relationships. Mm. Um, I don't know, you know, just wanting to say or something, and I don't know, I didn't even know what I wanted, but entering, seeing some kind of vibrational connection and entering in right away into some kind of relationship, and really not having any purpose for it at all, I think. I can't see one right now, anyway. So, now, now, like, it feels really nice to have a purpose in a relationship and like, um, I don't know, like growing bigger in it and feeling safer and I, I don't know, I can just see the perp the helpfulness of, of like a seeming exclusive relationship, like it feels sort of like there's two people coming together with a, like an intention, 
Because I think, you know, like right before I came to, into the community, I had this push away towards relationship, like, uh, you know, co the coarse terms, like, this is special, like, this is not what I really need. But, like, there's a helpfulness to it in my mind because, I don't know, there's like terror in my mind for true intimacy. So, having one to be with and just open up to feels really helpful in my mind. And I don't think I could really do it any other way right now. It's like polyamory, it's like like intimacy with lots of people. I don't know how I would even attempt that at all. Because <laughs> it's uh, like scary enough with just one. <laughs> it's not easy at all. <laughs> yeah, she made that point. That with one, it's, it's a full-time <laughs> experience. It can be very intense and then it seems to be more and more, but also implying that the states of mind and those levels of consciousness are possible to leave things open. And uh, I know with people who work with the Course, there's a lot of Course spin-offs and there's lots of spiritual teachers and there was, I forget where I was one time, this woman came to me and she was, she was quite disturbed um, in the sense that she had gone to see the spiritual teacher and and um, wasn't with the spiritual teacher very long, her and her husband, where the spiritual teacher said, now you two, um, Want you to split up, and you're going to go with different partners, and and um, it was a shock, kind of a shock to her system. I think for most people, there's certain shared agreements. You can call them whatever you want, shared agreements. Sometimes Teal calls them boundaries and so forth. But where she thought she said there's something that felt very strange about that, and. Um, she said, we, we kind of went along with it, but, but it just seemed to bring up all kinds of strange feelings. Um, and, and she was wanting to take responsibility for everything in her mind, but, but also, uh, I think that was part of what came through, what Teal was sharing about, you know, there, there's like an honoring that has to go on. If, if even Holly Amory is described as, as a choice between individuals in a conscious way, it's very different from cheating. Like in fidelity, there's secrecy, there's hiding, there's going behind someone's back, and so on and so forth. And she was emphasizing well, with polyamory the consciousness, like it's a conscious decision entered in. Even with that, there can be a lot of emotions that would come up. Even if you made a conscious choice, there still could be a lot of emotions there. You would almost think that there would be a those things coming up, because it's um, it's almost like that. There does seem to be a simpleness in monogamy, where it's not like who's going to be in the bed or, or who's going to be this or this. There's there's still putting it out. There's still a bit of a structure to it, and there's still a bit of a a form. But it's something the mind is saying, I can deal with this and accept this, and this is what I can work with, and. Uh, I think more and more as you evolve beyond the limits of the belief in linear time, then you you won't see people the same way, you won't see situations the same way. Uh, you could just, it would be like literally a dance, like leaves dancing in the wind, where, you know, there, there's a sense of just a naturalness to, to the movement of all things, and not a, a, an interpretation or a judgment of what this means. What does that mean? There's so much stuff about people being together, being together sexually, lying together, you know, the world, even some of our um, our angel baths, I was doing, um, looking at one, we had one that was recorded, I think in North Carolina, it was a very intimate angel bath, and then there was one right out there in the monastery that's, that's on YouTube when people see it, and it's close up to people's faces, and all the ecstasy and touching, somebody will be going through and somebody will go and go down on the ground and be touching the back of their legs and, you know, and, you know, it's, it was a very natural, <laughs> for everyone there was probably just... Freaking everybody else out. <laughs> yeah, but it's fun to see it on YouTube because it's like, okay. And that's also another aspect where 
she mentioned something like people can choose a monogamous lifestyle if it at this time on the planet if it benefits the whole. I got a, a taste of that a little bit because I traveled around initially so much in a solo way. And then when I started to have a travel partner and I started to show up at these different houses, the people reacted differently mm -hmm. when this body was with another body, with a female body. So it was like, oh, come on in, stay, stay with us. And there was like a welcome because it was more the idea of a man and a woman, that symbol was more socially acceptable. Like Teal just said, we, the societal norm is couples. And, you know, and Jesus even takes that concept of couples and he says the ark of peace is entered two by two. It's interesting words from Jesus in the Course, where we know that the ultimate state is a state of pure oneness, but he's saying the ark of peace is entered two by two. The whole Course is written in the context the symbology of relationships. Very different from meditation standards and you know going off to live in remote places and very solitary journeys and even certain meditation practices of you know don't don't look at the opposite sex or this or that. I remember when Jenny first came over uh, to the United States before she came to the Peace House she went up to that that um, like kind of that oneness university up in in Iowa, uh, where um, yoga, yeah, where they have a lot of teachings, and where um, who's the guy who's in the room? So Jim Carrey gave his um, commencement comment yeah. for uh, graduation, graduation yeah. speech, and she went there, and this was like a long tradition in meditation and consciousness training, and so. They told her, you know, do this, but there's certain ones that have been there for for many years and they, they walk around and there's certain men, they're called certain, but there's not even supposed to be a woman that comes near them, you know. And Jenny went out wandering, because they're not supposed to have a woman walking near this group of men. And, you know, almost like that can be a distraction to them or something like this. And then when she went into all the meditation training, they had, they would ask her all these questions and and they would, they had colors to evaluate where you were, it was a lot of evaluation, um, where you were, and she, she finally, she felt a bit strange, and she remembered that I had invited her to come to the Peace House, so she came and she said, wow, it was, it was some really strange things, but the initial draw was to this, this oneness and this meditation practice, which was very much a part of her life, it just was some very strange things that she observed in her own mind. So, I think that's that's another thing um, that it's highly individualized, like Suzanne was saying, and that also we it it can be based on what serves the whole. Even with a group of people, you may have a group of people that end up living at the monastery or the peace house or over at masterpiece or someplace that that maybe they are ready for a polyamorous kind of experience, and that's where their level of consciousness is, and and for them it flows well. For others, like like you were saying, like, wow, well, I can't even imagine something like that. That's not within my realm right now. I, it's, it's intense enough with a monogamous relationship, you know. It's so, those are the kind of things that, it's, it's a version of that Course in Miracles workbook lesson. I will step back and let him lead the way. There are many versions mm -hmm. of that as it plays out in a world of specifics. Mm -hmm. And Jesus has never been one to avoid specifics. Where sometimes with the Veda Vedanta, you know, all is one, all is one, and the discussion. It's just rep repetition of all is one. Where Jesus is very much like, well, the ego made the specifics and now we have to use what the ego made because you still believe in mm -hmm. what the ego made. So. This, you can say as many Hail Marys as you want, you can say all is one as many times as you want, but actually, experientially, you know, we're going to have to be honest with each other and work on this. And the whole path of the Course is using, letting the Holy Spirit use the symbols to unwind the mind back to God. In fact, um, we had this 
guy Earl that just wrote in to, uh, that uh, Suzanne was telling me about, and he's been very much into Buddhism. He went to a talk by Gary Renard. He was just wowed mm -hmm. by the Course, and now he, he loves the Buddhism, and he loves the Course. He loves retreats, and he may stop by mm -hmm. um, up in this area. January, early January, very soon, maybe come here for a visit and maybe come to the monastery if we're having the you know, soul room mm -hmm. people out there and all this and that. But there has to be like an honoring and a respectfulness and also it comes back to the purpose. It's mm -hmm. how, how can anyone judge the form of anything mm -hmm. when it's the purpose that makes it helpful. And the purpose is not, it's not something that's out there. It's, it comes back to, what is my purpose for this, and who am I to judge? Who am I to judge anything? Who am I to judge any form? Who am I to judge any person? Who am I to judge the motivations of others? You know, how is it that I could have a negative reaction to, to something that I'm told about form, without it being coming from my own mind, my own consciousness. Mm -hmm. So what what business do I have at pointing the finger? Mm -hmm. And somebody told me whenever you point the finger you have three fingers pointing mm -hmm. back, one for the Father, one for the Son, mm -hmm. one for the Holy Ghost. You have the Trinity <laughs> all laughing at you every time you point the finger. Mm -hmm. What are you doing? What are you doing? That's crazy. You know, mm -hmm. that's not you. That's not who you are, that's not how you were created. You know, if you remember that analogy every single time. And also, it takes a lot of trust to do that because the ego is so very, very suspicious of everything and everyone. It's always painting a, a very suspicious picture of like, oh, what, what's, what are they up to? <laughs> We're going along, we're floating along, we thought we had it all settled here, and then, then this, you know, like, what are they up to? And, mm -hmm. and you know, in the end, you, you have to just be aware of that suspicious voice, mm -hmm. and, and be willing to expose it mm -hmm. every time it rears its head up, in, in, in the light of love, and say, you, even to say to your brothers and sisters, hey, I need some help, I've had some crazy thoughts, mm -hmm. and, but they're there, and so... And I think that's the, the really, truly, we're all poly, what is it called? Poly polyamorous. Or polyamorous or emotionally already. here, yeah. because if we're not, then we wouldn't be here, because it's all about exposing, and I think that that's a beautiful stepping stone, you know, a step. It's like you open up your minds together so intimately here, but of course we're polyamorous here emotionally. Yeah. You know, and that's that starts to for me anyway, it helped me to start to come into that experience of it didn't really matter if this body is with this body or that body or if I'm holding somebody one day or somebody else the next day. It loosens that up because it becomes secondary, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's that's true that we could we could definitely say that that's the case, and then, and then as you go deeper, deeper into that, that I think the key point she made was that that with the only time the drama comes in, the only time the conflict even seems to enter, is when there's a deeper question about self worth, yeah. where she said mm -hmm. there must there will come a point in our evolution mm -hmm. where it, it won't matter about the, what the world seems to do or think, because we'll see there's no world outside. Mm -hmm. And it won't matter about relationships, because our worth is not determined by relationships. She pointed out that from childhood mm -hmm. on, there's so much of a sense, mm -hmm. like Sally Field, you know, uh, you know at the mm -hmm. Oscar, they love me, they holding her like Oscar, really they, like, like, they really like me, they really like me, you know, everyone's like, oh, because it's so ingrained of being loved, of being liked, of being appreciated, and and then when you get to a point where you start to you feel your worth is in your purpose, 
Your worth is in your giving light and extending love and light, and it grows stronger and stronger and stronger, then those relationships lose their meaning. You could have somebody that's been in your life for many years, seemingly informed, saying bye bye. You're like, I wish you well, I love you, I bless you, instead of you, how dare you, you know, and you don't even write, and you know, and all this, you know, all the expectations around that, because this mm. whole, you don't need the bodies and the persons to acknowledge mm. who you are, or your worth, or your purpose. Like your purpose is totally beyond, it transcends the, the images. Mm. And, and that's what's so, so beautiful. So you don't want to try to, to, we call it metaphysically ghost, like just affirm the words, thinking that just by saying the words, that will make the state of mind. But you do want to keep practicing at releasing any kind of judgments and thoughts that come up, because that will bring you into the state of mind, mm -hmm. where you can truly speak from your heart and mean it. Mm -hmm. I love you. A, a sense of, I love you. You can, it can come out of your mouth freely. I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. And you mean it, mean it, mean it, mean it. You know, it just feels good. Mm -hmm. It's not this sense of demands or some kind of a expectation. That you say that and then somebody is supposed to respond. You know, it's, it's wonder if people respond, if people don't respond. It doesn't change your worth, it doesn't change your purpose. Mm -hmm. You're more like Johnny Appleseed, you're a flinger of love seeds. Mm. You fling, fling, love fling, seeds. fling, 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 <laughs> and you fling them everywhere. And, and even the parable about some landed in the thistles and some landed in the who cares? You know, it's not your objective to be evaluating whether where they land, or whether they germinate, or not. Whether they grow into plants, or trees, or whether they just sit there on the rock, just a happy little seed on the rock. If you're fully into the joy of flinging, <laughs> what does it matter? There's no consequences. But that's another thing that's beautiful about our reflection of our community. We're not really into, not into things like size or growth. If it expands, it expands. If it shrinks, it shrinks. If the circle's closed, it's closed. If the circle opens, it opens. You know, we can be in that place of celebrating everything and not thinking that it means something. You know, like from a sales perspective, you know, people go, oh, it's shrinking workforce, or shrinking production, shrinking gross national product, those are all negatives. Expanding economy, expanding, expanding. To the world, those are positive, but it's all relative. It's just, you know, and because it's relative, it doesn't really have any lasting meaning. So who cares if something shrinks or expands? Really? You know, in the end, you who really cares? Who is the one that even cares? I, I feel like one of the first things that made me feel very welcome here was that like polyamorous experience of, of affection and just brothers and sisters like just being really in tune with what was the call for and you know even that welcome from I remember <clears throat> pulling Kristen aside one day and said like, what's this making thing? How am I not supposed to fall in love with Jason? Like, what's that about? And her just saying, oh, no, no, that's okay. You're supposed to go right ahead, you know? And then for me, of course, that was the only way it could happen because it was so safe. You know, it was like in this uh, this three thing. It was so, 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 so safe. There was, you know, we just was... Yeah, and I think what I've noticed is, like, it felt like over the last year, somehow it became less like that and somehow tighter so in my experience I'm not saying it's true but so I could get into a complacency and a kind of a sense of that would never get flushed up for me there was no there was no level of intimacy that was coming closer to me in form you know just as a symbol I, I could go, go dead to certain parts of myself And I felt a little, a little bit stiff, not with everything that was being said, because I'm actually, I think, I feel that's very natural. I could just see where I'd shut parts of myself down, thinking, well, I'm here, so like, 
that none of that will happen. That's all right for me. So yeah, I could just could just feel like and then and then this a similar but di different aspect who said you, you know even still there might not be that for you you know and then this it's just it was both everything being possible and then maybe not that at all either and and really i think i feel like i feel quite barefaced for at the forefront of like you said, a year of surprises, like, I don't know anything, and it's my mind, and, and anything that's helpful can't but come towards me in whatever way is helpful, and I couldn't possibly know what that would be. So, yeah, I, I just, it just feels more natural to me in my mind than this, than consistent one on one, that's it relationships. Because I mean, I love that JP once had a song that he wrote for me. I love that there was all these you talked about the romance, and I, like it's helpful to me. And and then I, I see that my own expectation for one to one thing drops away, and I'm just really open to where it's given. Who is it now in this moment? Who's in front of you? Who are you to be totally in love with and totally? singularly focused on in this second because they're right in front of you and it doesn't become a person and, and yet I still feel this possible you know it would be helpful for me to also have an intimate one-to-one -one type of scenario but then yeah I, I mean I think I think it was more supportive in my experience with Cody than it was I mean I can't compare but them with Thomas because it was it was we were doing this um, at the time you had invited us to do mutual momentary decisions and so all ideas of a future or all ideas of what it meant was gone yeah it's beautiful you can recall those and then also all the different times with Thomas and everything because I was part of some of those and even getting the green card and seemingly in the dream mm -hmm. you being here in the United States mm -hmm. from Ireland but here with a green card, and that has come in through all that. So it's like it all works together for the good, equally for the good. There's, there's, it's trusting that there's a presence behind all the images. It's just using the swirl of images to take the mind higher and higher. And, and that's a beautiful thought. And then when we fall away from that, and we start to examine it specifically, yeah. it always starts to deteriorate. Because there's there's some personal component that comes in, and that's I mean that's I feel really grateful that I had a, a quarter of a century of of travel, because you know I'd be just get into the joy and the glee of the miracle, and I'd be somewhere wherever in Europe, and they'd say, um, uh, "What are you going to do when you go back to the United States?" And I'd say, "United States? That's a hypothetical." <laughs> I, I would just be so in the glee of the moment, it would just roll out of my mouth. They would, I'd say, do you really think there is a United States to go back to? And they would be like, oh my God. But that was, that was my experience in the moment. I would just say, that's hypothetical. And, and to start to really give yourself full permission to go into that expansive state, where you start to see that everything is hypothetical. In fact, when, you know, that was part of the whole Quantum Forgiveness book that, that Nikita really put together. It was this, we defined hypothetical, you know, it's, it's like, hypothetical is an as if. And the whole universe, the whole cosmos is, an as, is a hypothetical. Because it's an as if the separation happened. It's, it's all hypothetical, but when the mind locks into the concrete and says, oh no. Forget this hypothetical stuff, all this love, love, love stuff. I'm talking practical specifics, you know. Then it's it's really into what it calls practical hypotheticals, which is an, an oxymoron. There are no practical hypotheticals. It's the undoing of the belief in the hypotheticals that frees the mind to soar and to see that it's everywhere. Like that's what Lisa 
when she was thinking that everyone was going to the movie the other day, a joy movie, and she heard, I am everywhere. You know, well that takes away the here or there, or go or not go, you know, it just was, I am everywhere. It's just, it's a rest, yeah. the rest that comes with that. So, yeah, it's, it's just fun to, to just watch, to observe, and to start to feel that contentment of just being able to observe and watch the stream mm -hmm. go by without thinking you have to shape the stream or I want the stream to look this way or mm -hmm. that way or getting all locked in to like future goals and future outcomes. It's quite a, yeah, quite a thing. I think as well, like, I, I wouldn't have known it for myself at the time, but that but um, like um, the, em the emotional commit commitment to like never hanging up the phone on each other was what I needed during that time with Thomas. Like, and I would never have known that that's what I needed. Like, that commitment there that was definite for communication. So, yeah, yeah, you know, that was more important than anything. Yeah. For me there. Yeah, it was funny, they showed the, the man laying in bed with his par partner, and then all these hands <laughs> on the side, and just the look on her face and the look on his face, that there's all these hands. <laughs> you just see hands in the side of the picture, and you see her looking over, and, and him just like, like, you know, it's, it's just to get to a state of mind where, where the form is no longer causative where there's no interpretation of something's gone wrong yeah. in form. You know, we use that metaphor, but it's more, we use it more of an experientially, like we say something feels off, something feels strange. We're not saying the form is off or strange, we're saying the perception mm. of the form mm. is strange or off. And that we can do, we can say, oh, that's wrong-mindedness. It's, it's, it's not a happy feeling, it's a contraction, it's a tightness, it's a closed down feeling. It's not making a judgment about anything specific, it's just saying, oh my, my interpretation here is, is off. And then being willing to just say, I want to join in prayer for another way of looking at this. I want to see this from another way. That little crack of opening is, yeah, it's amazing. I just recorded, I've been recording the lessons and I think it was yesterday I was talking about the willingness to open to the holy instant and the saying it's so little required of you mm -hmm. that the ego is is insulted <laughs> and it has no contribution such a tiny little proportion of contribution the mind that's sleeping to make really the holy the might of the holy spirit in this tiny little willingness join and produce this enormous this amazing experience but but he was just saying, just don't add, don't try to add anything to the Holy Instant. Don't add, you know, I've got to do something or figure it out or I have to make something happen or achieve something or accomplish something or accumulate something or, you know, all these things of the world are all just attempts to add to the Holy Instant. And he's saying, no, just be willing for it, just desire it, to let it be what it is. Let it show you what it is. Don't think that you have to achieve it, which is really what a lot of socialization and enlightenment is. It's work hard, work hard, practice, 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 work, 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 and maybe after many years or many lifetimes then you'll get your reward, finally. Jesus is saying, no, it's not that at all. You can slide and slip into this simplicity by not adding anything to it. Don't add anything to it. Let the Holy Spirit lead you, show you the way. We're in the final days of the, the calendar year and if you, as you know, if you do the workbook lessons, those final five workbook lessons, this holy instant, what I give to you, be you in charge for I would but follow. You're, you're supposed to give, offer yourself, offer the holy instant to you know, to the, to the Holy Spirit to show, show me. So that's how the work begins, with the show me experience. Mm. 
not I'm going to show you. <laughs> Which, I'm going to do it. Like, if you go through, like, two years of college or ten years of schooling, then you've got to do take a big exam or you've got to do some kind of big project or some thesis or whatever, and you have to prove your worth by doing and showing. But it's the Course is saying, no, no, it's time for you to resign as your own teacher and don't play show, show you with the Holy Spirit. You play show me. Mm. You've got to play show me. It's, it runs against all our conditioning. It runs against everything we've ever learned in this world. Show me? You're going to show me? It's like, yeah. Let's play one final game here. Oh. Let the Holy Spirit show me. So that's really nice, because that's saying that you aren't going to reach it through doings. Mm -hmm. We can actually throw that one out the window and say, okay, I'm not, I'm not here as a doing, as a human doing, trying to do enough to make it back to God. It's just, that's just not the way that it works. And let all things just come. And welcome, embrace everything, you know, every day. It's like, you show up, whatever somebody's expressing, screaming, shouting, you just be like in wonderment. Like, oh, it's so beautiful. Just, you know, it's like, this is my mind. Thank you for showing me my mind. <laughs> Instead of trying to fix somebody, oh, thank you for showing me. You're wonderful, you're delightful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that must be very healing for me. <laughs> um, actually, even at the mention of it, I think it was two nights ago or something. I mean, I was able to pass relatively quickly, but it was like terror. <laughs> I was like, oh, well, here we are. <laughs> um, just kind of drawing with Lisa, you know, just saying like, I don't know, this, like I want the authentic healing. I just know this feels like a very, like, vulnerable spot for me, or like a you know, soft underbelly. Um, yeah, because... I know I wanted to see it because I, I don't want to like leave that kind of hidden. It's, uh, yeah, there's just there's a sense of terror with that idea. Just. Like, my mind felt, feels kind of like so closed off to that idea, that's why I want to participate in it, because I don't want to be like closed off, but there's such like a fear, I just, I think just pain at that idea. Yeah. Yeah, it could even be like, you, if you've opened and taken so many steps, and then you come into this relationship with Yuda, and it seems so helpful and so amazing, that the part of the mind that feels the terror is just, it's, it's just like a fear of loss. It's like, no, 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 don't, I just got it, don't take it away from me. And, and that's why I think it's just helpful to remember that the Spirit is always, the Spirit never takes anything away, it's always an expanded view or it's always a retranslation. So if you think of things just, it's just that little tweak in the mind, that retranslation. But retranslation into something that's so wonderful, it's, it's indescribable in that sense. It's, a, it's something that, that's where all the trust comes in, faith, like, okay, I'm on this journey and, and you've told me nothing's going to be taken away. It may seem as if things are being taken away, but those would be just, sometimes the ego interpreting, so afraid of loss that it just will interpret Everything is being taken away, or stolen, or abandoned. But, yeah, it's just keeping the faith, you know, like Jesus, Jesus says in the healed relationship section, you know, you, you invited the Holy Spirit into your relationship. And can you not have the faith that you invited Him in, then 
let him come, let him abide, let him purify the, the awareness, which is what the whole invitation is about. So it's it's actually good just to, to yeah to let those fears up and that terror up and to talk. I think you had a, uh, Lisa said you had a good hour long session of just yeah just letting it come up, and and that's very common though that there's a fear of loss like something will be taken away. It's this we're we're being purified of this causation thing because I. I had a girlfriend in the mid 90s and oh my god we just started to just relax and drop the mask and started having these mystical experiences and then more mystical experiences and more mystical experiences and and then all I could remember at some point was the ego just coming in like don't take it away don't take her away <laughs> you know as if the mystical experiences was coming from her or from David and her interacting in some way or something like this and it was don't you know, like, don't, finally, <laughs> don't mess with this, you know. But, the, you know, there came a point where, you know, I just had to start to listen internally to, you know, it's, no, that was part of a reflection of your mind opening up to spirit. But, but, but the symbols aren't causative. The symbols didn't bring the mystical experience. They were, just reflections of it, and it was like, oh, again, it was all backwards, you know, like, the terror of the, f and the fear of loss was so great because of, of thinking that the symbols were that important, like, I can't live without these symbols, and, you know, that was more of just this gentle presence of the Spirit saying, oh, there's much more to come, you know, don't, don't think that this is the end of anything. Because, you know, it's just so many synchronicities, so many miracles, and every day just floods of miracles, and going out and finding this little cat, and we actually call the cat Sweetie. This is another Sweetie that's back, like, what is it, 1995, that's 20, 20 year cycle, Sweetie has returned. <laughs> it, and this was the Sweetie, we were out, we went to like a yard sale, and this, this cat, this little kitten was sitting on these row of books, and Janie was like, oh, isn't it adorable, da, 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 da. and they said, you can take him home if you want, and I said, okay, here we go, so, and then quickly naming the cat Sweetie, and then having a kitten coming back to the Winnebago trailer where we were living, parked in the back of a barn, and that was part of the mystical experiences, just a friend saying, just plug it in to the barn, and Oh yeah, come over and eat out of my kitchen whenever you want, swim in the lake, no charges for electricity, go out to Brooklyn, Michigan, rent movies, sit in bed cuddling, watching Chances Are and all these spectacular metaphysical movies, going into deep meditations, soaring in the spirit and everything. and. Not a care in the world, just gave ourselves permission to let go of everything. You know, let go of the future, let go of thinking we had to do anything, go anywhere, say anything, you know, just, it was just a permission in the mind, like to just soar. And that's what it was all about, and it was the permission in the mind, it wasn't my, David's mind or Janie's mind, it was just we merged in that permission. We merged in I need do nothing. It was great. I mean, I remember sometimes I was just so blissed out that I, you know, they just went to Vegas. You can open up, you can take the the, um, the little kitchen table down and you can make it into like an I dream of genie like bottle with just pillows, which she called pill use. Pill use everywhere. Pill use was all soft. And I remember I'd get in there and I'd be just like, uh, and then she'd come over, we'd cuddle, let's watch a movie, have something to eat, this and this and this. The only time I would get off of the I Dream of Jeannie pillow was occasionally I had to go out to pee. I would just go out to pee in the grass, which was two and a half feet high. Nobody's mowing the grass. We're parked behind the back of a barn. We don't have to think about anything. So, 
And then she, because she had watched me go around and give all these talks on the course and everything, she said, at one point she said, it scares me to see a body so active all day long. Like you just go from group to group to group and you just share and talk and she, it was just total activity. She watched me and she said, it's scary. Then, when I got into the Pilio at this Winnebago, I just let my hair grow, yeah. Eat, sh have shakes, watch Chances Are, and all these great movies, and sit there in this soft pillow, and cuddle, and everything, and she said, it's scary to see <laughs> how inactive the body can be. You're not leaving, you're not going anywhere except to pee, or to go out to defecate, or, you know. So, it was the same thing. It was, it was scary to see a form that active or that inactive, but I didn't care, you know, it was really, because I'm not interested in, in evaluating what a body's doing, you know, it, was, it just seemed the most natural. But you see, it took a lot of permission to let myself go into that experience of not caring for the form, of actually going soaring into that purpose, into that joy, into that presence, and saying, I don't care. That was, you know, who knows what our lifetimes are of, of meditating, and postures, and rituals, and, you know, all these attempts to reach God, you know, through form. And then, it's this stunning discovery when you realize that it's been you all along, your mind, and you can just give over. That was what Lisa's last year down in Mexico was, you just gave yourself permission to not care, to be used, to be in purpose, but to not care about anything. Not care about people, you know, you've had different ones, I know different ones. Jeff, Andy, you'd probably go into visitor and mm -hmm. share whatever you need to share, she didn't care. <laughs> she, didn't care about the, she didn't care about the form, she cared about the love, but she didn't care. And since she'd call me and she'd, she'd go, My function was to be happy. She said, I'm happy here, and I told her, I kept telling her, that's your, your only function is to be happy. And then, then when the people started to leave, she said, the numbers are going down here. Should I be worried? I said, no. And so, <laughs> the numbers went down. You know, it's like... They're disappearing. They're disappearing, they're falling like flies. Should I be concerned? No. I told you, be happy. It's the one thing you got to do, just be happy. It can't be that difficult, just be happy. And, and so she's okay, all right. And she, I, I took my function very seriously. <laughs> but it's, you have to, it's all about allowance. She had to really, Beautiful. you know, it's, it goes against all the programming to be told, just be happy. Because the mind has got, oh, it's got so much programming in there. Oh yeah, just be happy, right, right, you know. But it is, and, it, and, and it's all, you just see how the beat goes on. And it was a big step to come, to leave Mexico and come up here. And then all kinds of miracles unfolded, and then to hear about that electric stuff, you know, all the stuff that went on, and now it's just, it's just hilarious. It's, mm. it's like some kind of an, a Lucille Ball episode. <laughs> the wires were crossed, and now we've been overpaying, they're going to they're gonna give us credit, you know, it's just, Really? Yeah. Yeah, Jeff didn't hear about the it. The wires were crushed. So then we would put solar in, the I bill went up higher. The bill went up there. Because the wires were crushed. They were like crazy guys. It we took a lot to discover the wires like, were crossed. God, were there's two we talk, That's there. how we started this whole talk, was in your mind, when the wires get crossed, it's, it's a bizarre time-space experience. You're like lost in space, like the old television show. And then when the wires get turn back around, you get rewired, then it's like, oh, there was no problem there. It just was, it had the wiring crossed, that's all. I had an ego wire <laughs> stuck in there. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, so it's, I think there's a sense of, there's a real great cause for joy. Mm. And, and, a, and a, a reminder that, yeah, that it's not for me to judge. Who am I to judge? That's a line from one of Donna Marie Carey's mm -hmm. songs. Who am I to judge? 
How am I not myself? You know, that's the thing in I Heart Huckabee that got bred out of his Shania story over and over and over. Shania this, always trying to one-up Shania, and then the existential detective says, Billy Tomlin does, How am I not myself? How am I not myself? How am I not myself? <laughs> and he's like, ah! All this rage comes up, because that was the question that he needed to be asking himself. How am I not myself? When I'm judging, that's how I'm not myself. Whenever I'm judging anything, then I'm not myself. I wasn't created to be a judge. So that's, that's kind of fun to have a little can opener in there. So that's kind of fun to be continued. Yes? Every day. <laughs> it's our life. The poly amour or whatever it is. <laughs> we got into it. We didn't even know we got into it. It's like, oh yeah. Yeah, we can't even remember the name, but... We're all in emotional polyamory. Yeah. And just watching... Watching it go from there. Let the Holy Spirit take the lead. Coming giddy. That's what they were saying today in the hallway. Giddy, giddy. <laughs> <laughs>